Welcome to the second day of the Comic Symposium of Chicago. My name is Ingrid Olson. I'm Sarah Drake. We are the organizers of this little shindig. Uh, today we are delving even deeper into the comic scene in Chicago through our two panel discussions this afternoon and evening. First up, we have Imagining the Identity of the Self and Other in Comics. And I'd like to introduce our panelists and moderator. Our moderator this evening is Stanford Carpenter. He's a cultural anthropologist and assistant professor in the Department of Critical and Visual Studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He uses ethnographic research among artists and media makers for scholarly manuscripts and art-based projects. He is currently finishing a book for Duke University Press on identity and comic books from the perspective of comic book readers. As Brother's Story, he is a founding member of Critical Front, an arts-based project in which members use superhero alter egos as a means of cultural criticism and research in cultural production. Follow Brother's Story on Twitter or become a fan on Facebook. Um, and our panelists, we have Jeffrey Brown here in the center. And he abandoned painting and began drawing comics with his first autobiographical book, Clumsy, in 2001, while earning his MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Since then, he's drawn a dozen books for publishers including Top Shelf, Fanographics, Drawing Quarterly, McSweeney's, and Chronicle Books. Simon and Chester published his latest graphic memoir, Funny Misshapen Boy. In addition to directing an animated video for the band Death Cab for Cutie, Brown had his work featured on NPR's This American Life. His art has been shown at galleries in New York, San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, and Paris. He currently lives in our very own Chicago with his partner Jennifer and their son Oscar. Next, we have Nicole Hollander. Um, she's the creator of the syndicated comic strip Sylvia, which can be seen in the Boston Globe and the Daily Planet in Berkeley and online at Uplink and Women's new E News. On February 1st, Sylvia was rudely evicted. Can there ever be a civilized eviction? From the comic pages of the Chicago <laughs> Tribune. Sylvia has recently been the subject of a musical entitled Sylvia's Advice on Aging, etc., etc. A very long title. And Nicole's new book, The Sylvia Chronicles, 30 Years of Graphic Misbehavior from Reagan to Obama, is being published by the New Press in August. Then we have Lucy Nisley. Um, she's the creator of the critically acclaimed graphic novel French Milk, a drawn travel journal from Simon & Schuster Publishing. She's also self-published a number of collections of her work, including Radiator Days and Pretty Little Book. Lucy graduated from SCIC in 2007 and was a and has an MFA from the Center for Cartooning Studies. Presently, she's publishing new work with first and second books and teaching an after-school comic book course for children at the local Chicago school. And lastly, we have Tyrell Cannon, graduated in 2004 from the very our very own School of the Art Institute of Chicago with a Bachelor of Fine Arts emphasis in drawing, film, and print. Following graduation, Tyrell moved to Los Angeles and worked on various television, film, and video game productions. Tyrell moved back to Chicago in 2006 and has continued to create comics and release them online locally. Hello. Okay. Um, one of the things that we decided that we wanted to do for this panel is to make sure that there was a lot of discussion in Q&A um, and also that we would as we're talking about things that you would be able to imagine, be able to see what we're talking about. So what we did as far as organizing the panel is, is that I had everybody contribute um, a couple of, you know, a couple sets of images that they wanted to talk about and each person talked for, um, for, in my case, less than five minutes, in their case, up to 10 minutes. And then um, we're gonna open the floor for Q&A. Um, the thing that, the, that I find really really interesting about comics is, is, is the whole issue of identity and, and avatars and, and the creative process and what happens when you're when you are making a comic, especially um, the fact that you start with a blank page. So everything is in, you know, it's kind of a pun, but everything's an affirmative act. You know, if a character is male or female, it's it you've decided to make the character male or female. It's not a situation like movie making where you're casting someone. You are deciding. You are deciding. You know how big their nose is going to be, what color their eyes are going to be, their hair, whole everything. Even if the character is not human, 
those are all conscious acts. And so that's why I tend to use the phrase imagining identity a lot. Um, so um, what I, you know, in my own work, um, the work that she referred to is, is basically something that I got involved in, started off as a dare, where um, I had gotten some, uh, myself and some other academics together, and, and we just had one of them had asked me to make a superhero of him, and because I had already made this superhero of myself, um, Brother Story. And um, I said, I was talking to him, and he was having me Anthem Man for his book, and he said, um, and I said, well, you know, the radical thing to do if you really want to do something funny would be to create a superhero group. And he was like, okay. And then we went out recruiting. And then while we were, while I was doing some other research, I was interviewing Derek Robertson, who um, does transmetropolitan, did transmetropolitan. And um, he was like, he thought the idea was cool, and he offered to make us action figures. So we each have these, like, put these 12 inch tall action figures with multiple points of articulation. Um, and it's been a very bizarre experience to actually hold something made after your image, made by someone else. And that's something that I know Sylvia also wants to talk about. Um, and that's the perfect lead-in. Yeah. Oh, I'm in. I'm on. OK. Um, recently, uh, I, I was in California because uh, a writer was making uh, a musical from a book of mine called Tales of Graceful Aging from the Planet Denial. And she wasn't quite satisfied because there was no Sylvia in the book. So she added Sylvia and had created this character. And when I went out there, I did some kind of you know, publicity for them. I did some library events talking. And then one of the ideas that came up was that Sylvia, the actress Joan Mankin, dressed as Sylvia in complete makeup would sit way in the back. Nobody ever looks at the back of the room. And as I was talking, she would confront me. And so I knew that this would happen, but still when this woman stood up looking like Sylvia in three dimensions, some character that only exists in black and white uh, on the comic pages, I, I was sort of shocked for, for a moment. Um, she said, I, I was talking, she said, I wrote those lines. And uh, then the moderator got up and said, shall I make her leave? And, I, and I, I know I was supposed to say something, but I said, this is so fantastic to actually see this character alive and, and walking, she lives, walking among us. And what she did was go down the rows and talk to people. And since no one knew she was going to be there, it was very strange, and people had an odd reaction to it. I mean, I think I would have had an odd reaction. I, I had an odd reaction even though I was prepared for her. But she walked over to a woman and she said, you don't look so good. What's wrong? And, and she kept pushing at her, and the woman became more and more angry and upset and felt that she had been um, you know, taken out of her anonymity, you know, and, and exposed to people around her. And so she was, um, she was difficult, and, and I wanted to say, Joan, move on, move on, move on. And later the woman came up to her, it took her a long time to understand what, what had happened, but she liked it after she thought about it. Um, and people who are more at ease can really respond and really play with that. Sylvia, I may we talk about my character a bit, uh, is that I created Sylvia to say what I couldn't say, um, to be much more in your face uh, than I am. I, and I think, of course, I think as I get older, I become Sylvia. I become more in your face than I ever was. Uh, people are still disappointed when they meet me because I'm short, and Sylvia is tall, you know, but, um, I get, I, I can say a lot, and I can say a lot, I mean, Stanford was saying, you know, you create, you are God in your world. You create this character who can do anything. Sylvia doesn't stand up very much, but she's pretty powerful, even, even seated. Uh, 
Then I started to think, if I wanted to talk about a political subject and I wanted a different voice, I had to create another character. And I find that when you create another character, that character has a certain way of interacting with other people. And that was very exciting for me. Instead of having movement in the strip, because you don't have movement in the strip, it's two-dimensional. There's no time stands still in a strip. Um, so I created other other figures to interact. So I I created um, I created a couple of women who are only identified by their qualities. There's the woman who is easily irritated. Uh, the woman who flies into a rage at the slightest provocation, that's the same woman. Uh, the woman who lies in her journal. She has a wonderful life lying in her journal. I mean, she, she calls Dick Cheney all the time and tells him off. Um, she calls, she, it's mainly political. She calls political um, people and for a while, she has a moment in time where she can talk to them and be ironic to them and then then they know who she is, and she hears the sad sound of the dial tone in her ear. Uh, and then there's Ruby the waitress who works for the HMO Cafe, who knows what you should be eating, even if it's disgusting. Um, the woman who does everything better than you, who is really Martha Stewart. Um, and Cass, well, let me, uh, I'll finish with Cass. Because what people really like about cats is the fact that cats are pure selfishness. That anything that you can think of about wanting the world to revolve around you, a cat demands, and my cats demand because they can speak. Um, and even if they can't speak, they can hold up little signs and demand that Heidi Klum be their new mother. So. Um, and I was just saying to someone here that dog, people who love dogs love certain kinds of dogs, but people who love cats like all cats. So I love drawing them. Next person.